This is Russell Carpenter, and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello, Ben Rock. Hello, Ilya Friedman. How the heck are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. <laughs> How about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Had to think about that for a second there, but yeah. Had to think, yeah. I, I get it. I get it. I'm doing good. It stopped raining in LA this morning and uh, the sun came out and, uh, you know, yeah, it's a much nicer cool. place. Still kind of cold, but, you know, what are you going to do? Hey, who's on the show today? He's been on the show before, but he's always great to talk to. Russell Carpenter, just uh, one of the most brilliant, amazing guys out there. And he shot a little movie that I, it's a little indie film. I don't know if it's going to do well. Uh, do you remember the title? I don't, I don't It hasn't the broken even yet. It's only at 1.9 billion, I heard today. <laughs> <laughs> That's Avatar The Way of Water. And if you've ever wondered how you shoot a movie that you don't actually shoot with cameras for the most part, although you do. There's, a fair amount, there's a fair amount of live action in it. Yeah. Russell goes through the extremely multi-layered onion of a filmmaking process that is making an Avatar movie, uh, which kind of deconstructs performance from appearance and has him shoot live action plates to match and live in these amazing CGI worlds that James Cameron comes up with. And it's like part live action, part performance capture, part animation, like all unique. And I got to say, look for technology like this to seep its way into every level of filmmaking in years to come. You know, it's interesting because I wasn't thinking of it at the time that I was watching Avatar 2, but just day before yesterday... I was looking at part of Alita Battle Angel mm, and yeah. there's a I feel like there's a lot of the same techniques going on there too and that's also another James Cameron produced movie. It's got a really a loyal following that movie but I don't think it was a massive hit so I don't think there'll ever be a sequel but if you are intrigued by the process that goes into these combination live action painterly animation layer cakes yeah. of stuff it you know it's worth taking a look at that and it's another James Cameron movie so you know never bet against Jim Cameron he's the guy never never yeah. ever bet against Jim Cameron I mean like Avatar the Way of Water is it's still going strong it's going to be the highest grossing movie of all time I'm sure I'm sure of it I've never been more sure of anything it's going to be the highest grossing movie ever I think it's like number five or something right now and it's uh, yeah it's, it's with a rocket it's on its way yeah, it's a juggernaut. But I, I think that like what's interesting about these movies, like Alita Battle Angel and Avatar The Way of Water, is that it's using animation in its most photoreal sense. So they're taking things that are created in a computer and they're making them as photoreal as the technology will allow. And it turns out it's pretty photoreal. You can go pretty far. And uh, Russell is just a, a wonderful guy. He really gets into the nut meat of how this stuff is done. And I didn't ask him about this because we didn't really have time. But I always think it's interesting that like it, it, he didn't start his career with this, but early in his career, he did probably the first well-known CGI using movie. And that was The Lawnmower Man. Mm-hmm. And we did talk about The Lawnmower Man in our first interview with him a few years ago. And, you know, it's easy to look at The Lawnmower Man and say, you know, the effects and stuff are dated. But what they were doing at that time, nobody had ever done anything like that. Not even close. That's true. And the fact that Russell, through his whole career, has kind of stayed on the cutting and often bleeding edge. It's fascinating and awesome. And also just one hell of a nice guy. Uh, super, super yeah. warm. I think I might have mentioned this to you, but our friend of the show who always comes on to talk Oscars with us, Janelle Riley, the week that we interviewed both Robert Richardson and Russell Carpenter had dinner with them both the same night, one night. And she was asking me like, uh, what should I ask the DP of Avatar The Way of Water? And I'm like, would you like me to send you what I asked him? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's she, probably, did, she did not take me up on that. Oh, I was gonna, it's about time, though, for us to probably hit her up to come back because it's going to be Oscar. It's I mean, it's Oscar season right now, but it's going to be Oscars here before we know it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll we'll probably bring Janelle on uh, when we know at least what the Oscar nominees are for best cinematography. But before we even get into all that, let's go into our close focus, which 
is sort of how the Oscar race is starting to shape up. And we're seeing it through. I know that we don't take the Golden Globes very seriously here because the Hollywood Foreign Press Association is problematic. Yeah. 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 They they have issues. And Brendan Fraser, who had credibly accused uh, one of the heads of that organization of groping him, didn't even participate, you know, wouldn't Mm. go to the uh, Golden Globes. But we also had the Critics' Choice Awards. And he did go to that. And he won it. He won there. And what's interesting is one of the movies that is pulling way ahead in all of these award ceremonies is Everything Everywhere All at Once, which came out in what, May? Yeah. Yeah. It's getting remembered. And if you look at the awards that it's chalking up now here at several different ceremonies, uh, they, they, I mean, Gotham, Critics' Choice, Golden Globes, AFI. I mean, yeah, there's they're winning in a lot of places, which is a sure sign that they're going to get some nominations for sure. Yeah, they, they cleaned up at the Critics' Choice Awards, like cleaned up. And the Daniels won Best Director. I believe it won for editing. And I can't encourage people enough even though, again, we, we don't take the Golden Globes that seriously here, to go check out Ki Hu Kwan's acceptance speech at the Golden Globes. So at the Golden Globes, uh, it only won two things, uh, Ki Hu Kwan for Best Supporting and Michelle Yeoh for Best Actress in a Drama, I think. Yes. And uh, both of them wonderful. But Ki Hu Kwan, I feel like Ki Hu Kwan as Best Supporting Actor and Brendan Fraser as Best Actor are probably our two best comeback stories and in a way, Ki Hu Kwan's story is even more insane because he kind of was really forgotten after being a child actor. And then this movie fully brings him back. Like his dance cards can be punched for a while. Just a quick correction. It actually did win for a uh, musical comedy. Uh, Michelle did. M- musical comedy. Okay. Yeah, musical or comedy uh, for best actress in a motion picture. So not, not uh, in drama. Sure thing, Hollywood Foreign Press <laughs> Association. That musical comedy, everything, everywhere, all at once. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. There, there is some music in it and there are some laughs along the way, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there is a score. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's absurdist. I don't know if that qualifies as comedy, but uh, it's interesting to see it shaping up. I'm a little bummed out that uh, Larkin is not getting a lot of attention for his cinematography and everything everywhere all at once. And if I can use my bullhorn here, like I think Larkin Siples work in that is just astonishing and groundbreaking for sure yeah but you know i mean it really is we have an embarrassment of riches in uh, great looking movies this year so i mean like so many of the movies are just freaking amazing i'm interested to see as we you know because we went down uh, some of the award nominations last time for cinematography like who ends up in that last round and does you know our guest today russell carpenter end up on there because like what russell is doing in my opinion is so groundbreaking It's not cinematography in a way that we have understood it for, you know, a hundred and something years of film history. Ever. He's inventing, he's he's, he's inventing new shit. He's blazing a trail right now. Yeah. He's blazing a trail. And again, it's a trail that I think a lot of filmmakers are going to be on. Well, let's stop talking about that and get to the, uh, the interview with Russell. He's amazing. Let's do it. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. We are here with Russell Carpenter, uh, who's been on the show before, but just a huge honor that Russell would spend a couple of minutes and talk to us about Avatar 2, which is more than a movie. <laughs> like it's, it's almost like creating a new form of cinematography as it goes. So thank you so much a for coming. A cultural over. phenomenon. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, there's that, too. I I remember, uh, you know, like hearing people talk about how, like, you know, the movie was going to have to make two billion dollars to break even, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, never underestimate a James Cameron movie. They all perform insanely well. Every time we thought that they were going to not, they always outperformed. Yeah, it's really amazing. I I think Jim is bold, of course, you know, in terms of what he's trying to do with, with his filmmaking. And yet he really never really can bet that he knows where the box office is going, but he yeah. still dares to go there. And kudos to to Fox and Disney because they dared to go there too. And so yeah, yeah. So I do not even know where to start uh, with Avatar two because it's like you guys created a whole planet. When I was watching the movie, sometimes I would just take sit back and be like, everything about this is created in a computer. Uh, I just want to understand how does working on a film like this reframe how you look at cinematography? Because obviously it's not shot in a conventional way. Yeah. Well, working on Avatar 2 totally reframed everything. First of all, you 
you just look at the time frame involved in making a film like this. And honestly, I don't know why anybody would ever make a film this way because it's so <laughs> time consuming. Because think of it basically kind of as a layer cake. And as they go along, layers are added and layers are added until you get to the final steps. But it doesn't mean that everything, you have to wait for one thing to end for the next stage to begin. But yeah. but you, you're right. First of all, when, um, now this is back in 2013, Jim and his two co-writers sat down and they started to imagine what this film or series of films would look like. And as they got into it, they realized that instead of this going to be two or three films, it's probably going to be four or five films because they realized that they had a lot of territory to cover. But even at those stages when they were starting to write this, the production designers, uh, Dylan Cole and Ben Proctor were getting involved and they were formulating and envisioning concept art that the writers and Jim could look at because they needed to kind of know the world that they were writing to. So now you have the writing, but then you have the creation of these worlds and as the writing continues, Jim would say, and we need this kind of scenario, and let's see what you got on that. Jim is uh, hes a grand provocateur. I mean, he will go to his people and just lay something at our feet and say, get back to me on this, but this is what I want. And so from the very beginning, you start to have these worlds created, but after the concept art, you go to the next layer of all these things, everything that you see in the film has to be created in the computer virtually. And that takes a long time and there are revisions on everything. And there's not only do they have to say, create say animals or trees or whatever, but mo mostly the animals that you see, they have to base it on something real, on something that people sort of know and they know how it moves. Because, you know, Pandora is standing in for earth. We want a familiarity, the audience to have a familiarity at some level with what they're seeing. So now you start that second part as the script's being made, the concepts, art is coming out, and now you're starting to create this stuff. This second level, though, starts, say, back in 2014, but lasts up until <laughs> the shooting of the movie. I mean, everything yeah. is totally evolving and totally changing. So there's a real moving floor here all the time. After that, then uh, after these locations are created, Jim needs to virtually scout them like a director would with going to any location and scouting it. And he, except that he has the advantage of saying, you know, move the Taj Mahal over there, you know, <laughs> or the Taj Mahal should be twice as big or, but I mean, but for him, it's that waterfall. It needs to be yeah. over here and all that. So once the virtual scouting is done, you go to the next phase, which is actually bringing in a group of people that Jim calls the troop and he will work with them and th this could be a year or a year or so and basically he starts to block out his scenes and what he's doing at this point is he's saying figuring out where he wants everybody to be in the scene and he shoots that with a virtual camera but also what's going on is now he has up to 16 other cameras what you call regular cameras and they are filming this blocking from all sorts of different angles, basically cutting possibilities. So mm. once he's got the blocking done, that goes to the editors and they will offer up various iterations of what the scene might be cut like. And Jim will start to hone that down. And then it's at that point that the actors come in. And now we're talking, started in 2013. Now we're up to late 2016, early 2017. The actors come in and they do their lines. Yeah, the advantage yeah. here, though, is Jim doesn't really have to think exactly about how he, he's cutting this or exactly what the angles are. But he records this and the actors don't have to think about anything else except performance. Also, then you've got Garrett Warren starting to work out uh, stunts and action scenes. There's the underwater photography going on. The actors have been captured. And then... As that's being finished up, and this was in 2018, I came in and I was on for about a year before we've enrolled cameras. And a lot of this time was figuring out how are we going to do this when we get into the live action capture of this. And all this time, as we're testing for the movie, we're also starting to integrate the world of live action capture and actually bringing a camera onto a set with the virtual world of, let's say, the two different tribes. There's the live action tribe 
And now we have all the people who've been creating these virtual images. And now we have to learn to play together well. Which is one of the things that blew my mind about this one is, and I didn't do a side-by-side -side comparison, but it looked like to me, there was a lot more live action humans right next to Navi or, or uh, you know. Yeah, this, this, they really upped the game, you know, in terms of the technology. Physically touching each other too, like interacting like any other actor would interact. Yeah, and that that was really, you know, this is uh, Jim going to us in the camera department and to the virtual people and said, this is what I want to make this happen. Let's talk about frame rate because this movie, I, I've seen movies that were high frame rate. I've seen movies that were regular 24 frames per second. It's the first time I've seen one that changes frame rate in the middle yeah, of the movie. Yeah, and, and you know, it's funny because when I watch it, it, it doesn't bother me, but I, I see stuff online that people said, What's going on with this? So, so some people are, it's jumping out. It didn't really happen for me, but the idea was we would shoot at 48 frames per second. However, we wouldn't shoot with the 180 degree shutter because that would just be too staccato. So we mm -hmm. went to a position somewhere in between 360 and 180. And we wound up around, I, I forget, 270, 275 or something like that. It says, okay, it has more clarity we're sampling twice as fast. Wet is going to have more to work with. And Jim will have the capability of moving things back to 24 frames. Also, not every theater in the world is an IMAX theater capable of, you know, 48 frame projection. So now we can e easily make 24 frame versions of this. And I know the thinking was a lot of the film will be at 48, but he, he felt like if, if you're just looking at some, especially just uh, a Navi face or a or a human face, that kind of clarity was not going to be needed and, and also might be just a little bit kinder. So that was the thinking behind going to 48 frames per second. Basically, yeah, yeah. For those reasons. Well, well, and I feel like it went to high frame rate. Like, I mean, I guess so much of it is outside anyway, but when you get to the water area, that's, that's where it kind of switches, right? Well, a lot of the water was shot. Yeah, I, I when the shot, I, that's kind of a misnomer because it's virtual. But yeah, <laughs> okay, it was, was real, exported. <laughs> what was exported exactly at a forty-eight frame rate? You know, and I and I thought that served things well. You know, because it, it's like the middle third of the picture, but it, it feels like it's you know with, with all the tension and angst going on in the picture, it's a departure into a a world that you do want to dive into. You know, and he wanted mm. to be really really immersive he does really put you inside the action. Oh, for sure, for sure. Especially like that last third of the movie, or I don't know if it's maybe the last hour or so, where they're in the sinking ship and all that stuff. Like, I found myself trying to breathe. It was a lot like while watching Titanic. And what was amazing to me about it is, you know, like in Titanic, you're in a set that's filling with water. And I know that they filmed this stuff in water, but I know that this is the set doesn't, you know, it's a virtual set, virtual actors, and you completely believe the reality of all of it. Yeah. And yet in terms of bringing a viewer out of their seat and into the movie, I think he's really, really good at that. And if you watch the way he, he moves the camera, he, he always wants the, the viewer to be involved in working with the movie. So a lot of times his shots kind of unfurl or unscroll so, yeah. or just pan. So it's, you're, not just, you know, you're usually not just presented with an angle but you're presented with a process that the viewer has to participate in and that, oh, I see this and now something else just got revealed and I can think about that for a little bit. And now we come back to this and now we're over here. And I think that that certainly adds to uh, the viewer's sense of involvement. So from a cinematography point of view, for a lot of the performance capture, the pure performance capture stuff, were you very involved in that or was that stuff going on before you came on board? That Well, that's the thing. And that's why I say this whole process is so different than what you would normally expect. And, and uh, Russell, how about this? Why don't you compare it to actually shooting Titanic? Because yeah. there was some flashbacks that, that were certainly happening for me during the sequences that Ben was just talking about. But I have to imagine that as you're now doing it for Avatar 2, the circumstances are so different the, of the, uh, the sinking ship, so to speak. Yeah. Well, the, that is different. With Titanic, I'm involved from the very beginning with the scouts, with with, with yeah. so much of the technical planning. Uh, that's me and my team, of course. You're always, <laughs> I mean, you're definitely always on set. 
he certainly didn't have to get as wet as I did on <laughs> Titanic. That's that's for sure. But sounds like everyone got pretty wet on this one, though. <laughs> a, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of the actors certainly did. Yeah, I mean, but it's in terms of what we were doing. Also, there's the feeling is very different because at the end of the day, even on Titanic, you feel like I know what we got. Oh, this is great. It was great to see this actor perform, Kate perform, Leo perform, all that. It, there wasn't quite that on the, this film, basically, because you're, you're basically seeing virtual performances and it's not quite the same connection. When I came onto this film, instead of having been involved from the, the very, very beginning, I just had a tremendous amount of catching up as to what had been done before and to see as much of what has been done before as I possibly could. So that that sense of involvement from A to Z is not the same. But even if I was going from P to Z, there was plenty to do there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's talk about the virtual lighting. How involved were you in designing the light for the virtual environments? Well, mainly what happens is that because concept work has been done uh, and there's concept art, and that turns into what Dylan in the uh, Pandora world and Ben in the RDA world are doing, they're transforming things there. And when I get things, e- either in the Pandora world, at least somebody, somebody's at least put in what's called an HDRI. Basically, they're 360 degree shots. They're basically domes, and you can at least start, because you have to have sunlight, start your forest by putting up one of these domes, and you know, oh, this is sunset, or this is just after the sun went down, and the light's coming from over here. I always had something to start with. And with Ben, he would definitely have some ideas on at least what uh, practical lighting you were seeing in the, the scene, and then we would go back and we could talk about it, especially scenes where we were going to have to have real lights in the scenes we didn't want to make he didn't want to make anything in the uh in his world that we couldn't replicate when we got to the the lighting so yes there there's an indication but then you have the the scene and like any cinematographer you you kind of you go into an environment and you say this is the house or this is the exterior and then you start to light the scene much as you would on a film set except that the tools are vastly different and that took a little bit for me to get a hold of us, what could be done with, say, the system I was using, Gazebo, with Gazebo and, and what it wasn't going to do that I could do on a real set. G- gazebo didn't do radiosity very well. Like if you hit you hit the floor with a light and you have light, whatever color the floor is, it bounces off the floor and it comes up on the wall or it may come up on the actor. That I had to kind of fake, right? Hmm. I, w- I would use my key light and then I knew it was supposed to bounce up and do something or in the forest. You knew this shaft of light was hitting this plant, and yet Jim really wanted a sense of the light coming off the forest floor. Then you kind of have to bury a virtual light in the forest floor, which is kind of fun. You just put the light wherever you want to, and then you just flip the switch. (laughs) And you get the effect of what that light's supposed to do, but you don't see the light, which, again, you're not going to do on a real set. So that, that was kind of fun. But otherwise, I found that there were a lot of things that I could ask for and do that, you know, I was working with some really gifted lighting artists and and they would say, well, okay, here, you want to see shafts of light. So you, we might put an overall light way above our virtual world. And then we would put some gobos in it or, but you really wouldn't really see anything in the atmosphere. So then with the, your virtual lighting, you could put basically an atmospheric ball in there. It's <laughs> invisible. I mean, it's just this, Let's put atmospheric ball over there. Then when the light hits it, you get the shafts of light, which, and then you can make the shafts of light, depending on how you had that dialed exactly to where you want, how much you saw through those shafts of light, that kind of thing. That, that was a lot of fun. Well, I, I have an inter- uh, question that is like, this process is so foreign to how I understand films to be made. And it's such a new and innovative way to do it. Were you basically given, because they'd done all this, prep work were you given like a final cut of the movie or or a near final cut of the movie and then were lighting scenes that had already been edited or were you given Uh, how does that even work well that's a hilarious story in some ways in some ways kind of unnerving because (laughs) when when i got in my imagining was i would start to be seeing cut scenes of all this stuff and so i one of the first things i did was 
go over to the editorial department and say, what you got? And I thought they were kidding me. Uh, almost nothing, because things were continuing to come out of the process in bits and pieces. And you could look at a scene one day and you would say, oh, look at the, you know, you're looking at the, say, set dressing in the Marui. And then two days later, you might notice that, oh, there's something else here. Or this got moved over here. And it's, you know, you're doing, well, what am I lighting to here? You know, and, and so there was kind of a, a gold mine of information, but not of cut scenes, but of things that Jim had done with a virtual camera. So uh, Len, my gaffer, chief lighting technician, we, we started going through this. Jim would only probably do just one or two angles on that just to get a sense of the blocking. And we wouldn't be seeing cut scenes, but uh, we would see kind of all the pieces that would go into those cut scenes. Mm -hmm. It got better. I mean, it got a lot better. But when we first came there, I was just surprised that that there was just not, oh, and here's the final scene. And now let's get to work on it. And uh -huh. you know, that did eventually happen later in the going. I got to ask you about all of the different formats that are now available. Like most moviegoers have never had the number of choices for any movie as they have for Avatar 2, including IMAX and 3D and high frame rate and uh, a format called Screen X, which is showing parts of the movie on the walls alongside of you. Uh, I got I got to ask you, what is your feeling about is there one format that you love more than all the others? And how does this change your your final exhibition process? I mean, are you watching each version of this and, and figuring out how uh, yeah. we you know, I when we were shooting I had several monitors to look at, you know, one was, uh. OK, here's the monitor that shows us kind of what I call our LUT, what we think we this is going to look like. Now, here's a monitor that shows you everything that the camera is shooting to make sure you're getting, at least it's recording the color you're eventually gonna want. And now here's the uh, 3D monitor. But on, on our main monitors, we, we basically settled on, on two framing lines. We, we settled on 239, which is actually my favorite, or 240. And then we had basically what would become our IMAX frame, which is what, 179 or sometimes 185, depending on the IMAX you're looking at. We took our 239, and raised it up a little bit so that you could compose for both without having it look too stupid. And, and I'm <laughs> common top. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So same, I, same headroom. We never had big discussions about it, but it, you know, it was always framed so it would work for both. That said, this film is going out in a tremendous amount of formats, and it's in the hundreds. I mean, it's uh, really, yeah, and I mean, not only for the country they're shooting in. But the idea was there are different 3D systems that work with different oh, yeah. blades. There, there are, there's this kind of system, there's this kind of system, this system's using this many blades. Then we have our 2D versions. Different, and this is what they, I think this was great. What they were thinking is, we know these theaters, their screens are not gonna be as bright as they should be. These are, are running at this light level and these are running at this light. They literally made a different version for, Oh my God! All, all, really? all those no, that's brilliant. No, no, because what usually happens is one movie is made and it's sent to everyone, and a whole lot of people have a terrible experience watching it. And this has been customized to Foot Lamberts or to, to the the total amount of the lumens on the screen. So that's amazing to me. And of course, there's these competing 3D systems. Uh, I had no idea that it was going to be customized per those systems like that, though. That's that's fascinating to me. No, I know there are. Well, I mean, of course, also the different versions for different languages. Uh, talking with Jeff Burdick, who who is often tasked with this kind of thing. I'm going to guess, I, I think he said 157 different versions of the film. That blew wow. me away. But it also demonstrated a commitment to not just throwing the film out there, but making making the display of the film as optimum as it could possibly be. Oh, OK, so your favorite format. Do you like IMAX? Do you like 3D? Do you like 2D? Can you pick one that is your, your favorite format to see the movie in? Generally, 239 is my favorite. IMAX, totally works for something like this but but that's that's usually my default that's what i settle on so but of course i'm looking at 239 but i'm also of course always looking at what's what's going on at the top and the bottom of the frame too 
uh, Russell, it was, it was so much fun. I'm sorry we weren't able to do it in person this time, but I'm so glad that you got to come back and that we got to, to do all this, this all again. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, you usually at the end, uh, we, we ask people uh, where they can find you, but uh, where people can find your movie is basically every movie theater in the world <laughs> right now. So uh, all I can say is if you're hearing the sound of our voices, uh, definitely check out Avatar 2. You probably already have. It's the movies, uh, you know, the number one movie in the country, in the world probably right now and uh it's probably going to set several uh records as it goes along besides having 157 versions it's going to set <laughs> more records all it has to do <laughs> yeah. is, no. is make is make a hundred dollars per version yeah. and it'll be in, in in profit no problem yeah and when it's released when it's streaming they have a different version for every single viewer <laughs> here's your version ben what yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway russell uh, thank you so much for coming back yeah. on the show it's just always okay, amazing thank to you. see what you do all right take care you take care all right so that was russell carpenter how much fun was holy that? holy crap that was great i just love talking to him he's he's just a wonderful sweet generous guy and really understands what he's doing he's just blazing a path that I think a lot of filmmakers are going to be on, you know, like if we check in uh, 20 years from now, how many people are going to be using this kind of technology just to tell a small Sundance movie? Because also, as we've seen, it's shocking how quickly this technology ends up like in your as an Instagram filter or something. Oh, yes. And, and you're able to do like outrageously good real time face tracking and, and stuff like that. And I feel like when this stuff ripples down, man, I'm really interested to see like what happens when like a David Lynch type or, you know, like we were talking about the Daniels mm -hmm. uh, from everything, everywhere, all at once decide to use this kind of technology to create a character or a, a whatever they create using something that allows your imagination to just kind of run wild. If I have a criticism of the Avatar movies, it's that the Navi are all humanoid. So they just look like big people. Mm -hmm. Big, big blue people. But at the same time, that also allows us to have more empathy. So I don't know. It, it goes, it goes around. I, I got to say, you know, when thinking back about Avatar and sort of the, the progression of this style of filmmaking and technology, I can't help but think of things like uh, Waking Life. Did you ever see Waking Life, which is like the entirely rotoscoped and painted movie? It's like, it's not like this is a particularly new idea. But it's just the level that it's gotten to now is yeah. is absolutely amazing. I think Waking Life was the first movie to use that kind of rotoscope style that they used in that. And it, later they used it in the same exact technology in a scanner darkly, which was a Philip K. Dick. That, that's right. And I want to say there's an Amazon series or a net. I think it's an Amazon series that also uses it that uh, I actually quite enjoyed recently. But I can't remember what it is. I'd have to look it up. It was it was a pandemic thing. So. Yeah, it was a pandemic thing. Man. Yeah, and, I, and I've just kind of blocked, like you know, blocked a portion you, of my. <laughs> you say you say that like we're out of it. Anyway, um, yeah, that's true. I, I did say it like we're out of it. Anyway, uh, so so Ben, you'll never guess what time it is. Uh, ten oh nine by my clock. <laughs> it's Bill paying time, and we actually have a special ad read today for our producer Alana Cody. What? Yes. <laughs> so if you like our podcast and you're interested in starting one of your own, our producer Alana Cody has begun her own podcast production and social media marketing company called Green Tree Creative. And you can find out more information at growwithgreentree.com. You can email her to find out more. And uh, growwithgreentree.com is where you can get uh, get in touch with her. And she can, uh, you know, possibly do what you hear here, what she's doing for us, for you. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, definitely, I would say a thousand percent worth it. Our show went through the roof as soon as Alana joined the team. That's true. And uh, she's been a, a godsend. Like we've gotten more episodes. We've gotten more amazing guests. I mean, like we were getting good people on our own. But like as soon as Alana was on the case, man, it just it became a much bigger deal. It's true. Everything, everything increased. Downloads, subscribers, listener emails, sponsors, everything increased when she came on board. So it's incredible. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it so. is our short end time of the show. What's your obsession this week? What are you into? Uh, what's what's new? Well, I went to see a movie in the theater, in the old-fashioned movie hey. theater, and it's a horror movie. Mm, uh, big surprise. And it's <laughs> called Skinamarink. And uh. I would say it's one of the most buzzed-about horror movies amongst horror fans that I know of currently, and how, how much of that buzz is because of the budget? Because that that seems to be like the headline everywhere is that it's another one of those movies, I, very low budget. 
I think uh, it is a very low budget. So the budget is fifteen grand. If and when you see the movie, you will not be surprised that they spend fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> it looks because, like fifteen grand, huh? Well, it's all shot basically in one house. There's mm-hmm. almost no cast. It's like two or three people. There's two kids and maybe two adults that are seen ever on camera. But when I say seen on camera, this movie doesn't really operate like a regular movie. And mm-hmm. and I'm kind of of many minds about it because after the movie was over, I was kind of frustrated in a way like if I'd seen a, a movie by Matthew Barney or something where it's like it doesn't move in a conventional way. It doesn't really give me what I want as an audience member. But what it operates like is it operates like a nightmare. And it really feels like a nightmare. So what that means is there's like lots of stretches where you're like looking into a dark hallway and it looks like old film and film dust and grain and scratches and globs and stuff. So it kind of creates weird abstract shapes and stuff, but no, but doesn't necessarily cohere. And it does have several pretty good scares in it. Mm. And they kind of occur in ways that don't feel con- nothing about this movie is conventional. Like if you want to see a movie with like dialogue and characters that like builds in a conventional way, avoid Skin and Rink. Uh, I should mention it's directed by, uh, it's a Canadian film directed mm. by Kyle Edward Ball and shot by Jamie McRae. Uh, this is Jamie's only cinematography credit. There were times where they say, I was reading an interview with the filmmakers where the only light source was a television. like, And it's like an old tube television kind of thing. Mm. But it's interesting. I've, I've often said of like Italian horror, like, uh, you know, uh, Lucio Fulci or Dario Argento or whatever, that a lot of those movies don't work narratively like a regular movie. Like they kind of tell a story, but they kind of don't. But then you think about it later and it's like, you know, a scene where spiders come out and eat somebody's face is horrific. And it, it feels like a nightmare that you had. This movie feels really like what a nightmare is like when you're having it. Uh, Hmm. It doesn't really follow logically. There's long stretches of like not a whole lot happening, but it really stuck with me after I saw it. I I can't necessarily say that I love it. And I also don't know that I recommend it. It's an odd film. And some uh, one of the people I saw it with was like, uh, is this guy going to go off and get a Marvel movie? And I'm like, you know, like jokingly saying that, like, you know, there's no there's no chance that the studios are going to come knocking on this person's door. But after watching it, I'm like, no, but this person got a theatrical release on a fifteen thousand dollar movie. Which is that means. Yeah. My my hat's off to that. That, That's incredible. Well done. They're going to get another movie and maybe that movie, they'll bridge the gap and like take this very interesting study in style and marry it with I, I'm not I mean maybe they won't maybe maybe this filmmaker just wants to make movies like this but uh, depending on how careerist he is maybe his next film he'll take kind of this thick heavy like the style is just thick all over this movie well and you know, you know it's on 600 screens now too so not only did it get theatrical that's like a you know yeah, it's a, pre- that's that's a pretty, pretty good release. that's a pretty big release you know I remember it was like week four when the raid redemption got, you know, blew up and was able to finally get to 800 screens. But before that, it had only been on like, you know, a relatively few number. It was like on five. It was like 20. Then it was like 125. And then it peaked at like 800 screens. Uh, that That's pretty incredible for a $15,000 movie to, to yeah, yeah. hit that number of screens. I mean, that's, that's you know, great. Paranormal Activity was also a $15,000 movie, which got on way more screens. Of course. But uh, this is not the Raid Redemption. This is not a, a, a plot driven action film. I almost feel like this would be better maybe better than seeing it in a theater would be if there there was like an art gallery uh, exhibit about nightmares and this was just playing on a screen and you could watch it and wander away. Did it kind of feel like that at, at times? Like you were, you were it, inside a, uh, you know, a, v, a video viewing space inside a gallery where there was uh, a little all, bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, art installations uh, of horror themes uh, on, on the outside. Yeah, because I mean, again, it's probably not a single shot. No, there is one shot of a person's face hmm. in the whole movie where it's like a clean shot where you can see them. Like most of it is like heavily, heavily obscured, darkened people's backs to you. And some of it's subtitled and some of it isn't. And there's no real logic to why some stuff got subtitled and why some stuff didn't. Hmm. Uh, there's genuine creepy stuff in it. And there's stuff that will make you just scratch your head. And again, if you're listening to me describe this and it sounds like an interesting idea, definitely check it out. I'd say support indie film. It's yeah, a great way to support it. In any film, uh, if you need like uh, an A to B to C plot, don't see this movie. Hmm. But I found it very interesting and it's probably something that visually I will reference in the future. 
That sounds uh, very interesting. I, I would probably wait till streaming. I don't know if I would totally enjoy it. I do enjoy those spoon fed plots. <laughs> I, I'm not uh, saying I don't, <laughs> but uh, at the same time, uh, I'll, I'll check it out. I'm curious. You made you made me curious. Yeah, it's worth checking out. Anyway, what is your short end today? Well, this morning, uh, Netflix unveiled its hopes for its new Korean television slate, and uh, it's really, really big. It's 34 new projects, including, of course, season two of Squid Game. Of and, course, uh, and that is that's going to be, be a big one. Netflix also released a season two of a show called Alice in Borderlands, which uh, predates Squid Game, to my knowledge. It's a it's a Japanese series. And I feel like in some ways, maybe the the prototype of, of Squid Game, there's some very, very similar themes in it. And now they've just released season two on the streamer. And uh, I don't know if it, the season two quite captures the magic of the first season, but there's some still certainly some moments in it. But if you are into that sort of like it's a game with extremely high stakes, definitely Alice in Borderland is not a is not something you should shy away from. You should take a look. But I think Squid Game season two probably has some of the highest hopes out there. I continue to hear people talk about it and I believe that it's going to be a big, big deal and which I think is very interesting in the same way that like Bong Joo-ho's Parasite just became like, you know, the cultural phenomenon and really, you know, like K-pop put Korean directors and Korean movies like in the mainstream in a way that it wasn't before. And I feel like Netflix continues to kind of like beat that drum and put a lot of like K-dramas and other sorts of stuff out there. But Squid Game might be like one of those things that really kind of helps it break through in a way that people are not just watching, uh, you know, watching their, their local dubbed version. Maybe they're watching it subtitled. Maybe they're actually seeing it how, it, how it's supposed to be. And it always kind of amazes me how many people do listen to, or do watch these things, not in their uh, original language. They see, you know, sometimes what is a, a mediocre performance or a decent performance with dubbing, but a lot of times it's just, it's not the same, at least for me, I guess maybe I'm a purist, but uh, I, I got to say that when you hear the original language, when you hear the original inflection, I think that uh, a lot more of the emotion comes through. I think that you understand. I, the emotion. I, I agree. And yet I will say, I actually know three people whose full-time job right now is directing dubs for, mm. uh, for streaming services. Yep. And they, they are working their asses off casting actors and directing actors and like really I'm not trying to take their I'm not trying to yuck their yum I'm not trying to take their jobs away but I gotta say that like I don't know what it is if I feel like it's the lazy way it's the lazy way to watch something I I I don't I don't know I I I feel guilty if there's a subtitled version and then for some reason someone else has got dubbed on it 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 makes me feel weird I don't I don't like it I I think that the the what we can say about the dubbed versions of of all this stuff is that it's bringing another audience. It's bringing a That's bigger true. audience. That's they true. They have figured out a way to take one of the barriers that people would say, oh, "I don't want to I don't want to watch this and read." And that's enabling probably millions of people who probably wouldn't have given Squid Game a chance to watch it. So, it's I, worth I, it for I, that alone. I get I guess that's so. And I uh, I'm delighted that it's coming back. There's a lot of stuff that was just announced coming back, but uh, Squid Game season 2, really looking forward to. I'm ready to go back into that whatever, you know, uh, dark dark places that was Squid Game. Well, I appreciate that that that's bringing you to uh, what I would call borderline horror horror story. You know, I got to say it does feel it's it's definitely got horror overtones. It's I'd call it a thriller, but it's definitely horrific. So it's a horrific yeah. thriller. Uh, anyway, so Ben, that is pretty much going to wrap us up. Where can people track you down if they want to track you down? Uh, please find me at benrock.com. Uh, if you go to benrock.com, you can find all of my socials. Uh, I'm also on Mastodon, which isn't on uh, Squarespace yet, but uh, one day I'll it'll be there and I'll put that there too. Find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all all the ones that you'd find expect to find someone of my age at. How about yourself, Ilya? Where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we got contacted by someone recently who uh, is not on any social media, and they found me, at, found me at Hot Rod Cameras, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, we are going to read their email in an upcoming episode, so you'll get you'll get the whole story. Oh, leave us on a on yeah, a cliffhanger uh, there. Exactly. It, well, I appreciate up. anyone who's not on social media because they probably have about five extra hours in every day. At least. So, yeah. uh, Ben, who do we have to thank for this uh, this show? As always, uh, Alana Cody, who uh, kicks yeah. all the ass. Getting interviews with people like Russell Carpenter. I mean, like, it's just 
a dream come true for us, for both of us. And you can track her down at growwithgreentree.com. Yeah, we should give her that every week. We should thank Ben Katz, who is uh, our intrepid editor, whose job it is, is to make us not sound like the idiots that, I I won't speak for you, the idiot that I truly am. Thanks. I I really appreciate not being lumped in with your idiocy. No, no, it's fair. It's it's, it's a fair thing. And lastly, but never leastly, we should thank Kay's Alatrachi, who created all the music that you heard on the show. Go to his website, musicbykays, K-A-Y-S, dot com. Send him some message about anything. For God's sakes, the man wants to talk to you. Send him a message about Squid Game. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Ask him what he thought of Squid Game. That's all you have to do. You don't yeah. have to You don't have to hire him. You don't have to give him power of attorney. Just uh, say... He's got opinions. He likes he, to share them. Oh, my God. Is he so opinionated? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Anyway, um, but that that's about it. Ilya, you want to take us out? Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.